begins with God. Everything. Everything. We thought about the Joseph this morning in our Bible study time. And you think about, well, God is at work and this is happening with his brothers. But God and Joseph is trying to work in his brothers' lives even there to help them see their sin. Just like the Lord Jesus always works to bring us to see our sin. But God was working before that. Before anyone else knew it, God was bringing a famine. I mean, the Lord is always previous. He's always before. It, everything begins with God. How are you going to approach the book of Genesis? Well, with simple faith to begin with. Just simple faith. The facts that are put forth in Genesis are to be believed. They're not to be tossed around and debated or at the whims of the world just... <laughs> directed by what they say it may be. There's unbelievable, as I've studied, all the different things uh, even good men have taken because of the billions of year nonsense that is put forth in our world. Genesis chapter 1, let's begin reading verse 1, we'll read through verse 13. In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, it's the first time recorded that God speaks, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. First day ever. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divide the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. You've got a vertical separating of the waters by God, then you've got a horizontal separating of the waters. Verse 10, And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called his seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good. And the evening and the morning were the third day. I want to look at the title tonight, God's Creation Days. We're going to look, going to look at the first three, and then dash, if you will, God forms. Here we see God forms these three arenas, if you will, and then he's going to fill them. In the last three days of creation. Many times people say this idea of the, the president of the United States, the most powerful man in the world. And uh, there's some truth to that. But just because the president says something doesn't mean it happens. But think of this. When God speaks, something happens. That's pretty amazing. Psalm 33, 6 says this, By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathereth the waters of the sea together as in heap. He layeth up the depths in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. And that's really, when you study this first uh, chapter of Genesis, the first couple of chapters, we just stand in awe of who our God is. Verse 9 of Psalm 33 says, For he spake, and it was done. Think about it. We talked about this morning about our God speaks to us. Think of the power of what God says, what happened in creation, all this. For he spake, and it was done. And then think that God speaks to you, and God speaks to me. He commanded, and it stood fast. You know, it's unbelievable. The truth is, if you don't believe in creation according to what God's Word says, there's so much Scripture you have to remove from your Bible. You have to get rid of Genesis, of course, but then Exodus. The, the young people in that great midweek service we had a few weeks ago, the graduation service, they quoted Exodus chapter 20. When they got to verse 11, it just 
shot out to me because I've been studying Genesis. For in six days, Exodus 20, 11, this is where the Ten Commandments are given. Right in the middle of the Ten Commandments here when he's talking about the Sabbath. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So you've got to get rid of Exodus. I just read from the book of Psalms about he spake and it was done and how he created so you'd have to get rid of Psalms. You've got to get rid of all the gospel records because Jesus affirmed that the creation happened just like God said it did. So it's just unbelievable when you try to say, oh, I'm not going to believe in creation and still try to be a Christian or believe in God. You, they just, the two don't mix. You just can't mix. When you consider the acts of God recorded in Genesis 1, Genesis 1 here, you can't help but bow and worship. Uh, if we would have been there, I'm hoping God will let us see it in heaven, you know. And um, we'll be there forever with no time, so we got forever, right? There's no, no clock ever again, hallelujah. And uh, that's just it. And so I hope you'll let us see it, but when we do, we'll ha- it'll happen just like everything else we'll see that ha- happens in heaven. We'll all fall down and bow to Him. Because it's just unbelievable what He did. This God who is powerful and wise, whose word carries such power and authority. There's no other response but worship him. Uh, Verse 1, we're introduced to this God. Like I said this morning, uh, the Bible doesn't ever try to prove or defend the existence of God. It just states that he is. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. God, of course, was already there. But we're introduced to God by his name, Elohim. Elohim, 32 times in this chapter, this creative God is called Elohim, that that Hebrew word. And it emphasizes God's power and God's majesty. Literally, it's the strong one, Elohim. Interesting enough, in Elohim, in that name, that Hebrew word, there's a uniplurality that hints at the Trinity. Do you know in the Bible, the Bible... In, in God's word, creation is ascribed to all three members of the Trinity. Uh, the Father, Acts 4.24, and when they heard that, they lifted their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Whoop, you got to get, throw out Acts out of your Bible now too. And, and to the Son, John chapter 1, verse 1 through 3, that creation is attributed to the Son. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. There goes John. Right? And so, the, uh, we know if you go to verse 14, the Word is made flesh and dwelt among us. So we know he's talking about Jesus there. And then the creation is attributed to the Holy Spirit, Psalm 104.30. Of course, we see him here in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2 as well. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. So Elohim reveals his power by creating everything, by merely speaking the word. Matter is not eternal. It began when God spoke it into existence. Everything. Now, we know from science class that matter can be neither created nor destroyed. That's true after this creation when God created all matter. But men today, matter just changes forms, right? It's amazing that men today so often would rather believe Darwin than Moses. Now, Darwin, if you read what he wrote, even on his deathbed, recanted. They wouldn't let anyone hear it because they didn't want to lose his theory. But uh, he, he was not super brilliant. In fact, he got wouldn't let be let into different places because of... But Moses, you're going to believe Darwin over Moses? You realize that the science of Kepler, Sir Isaac Newton, is obsolete today? Their theories, the theories of today's scientists, in 10 or 20 years from now will be just as archaic as Newton's. Scientists have this, what they call a five year half-life. This is interesting. This is what scientists call a five-year half-life. That is, in five years, half of what is now known to be fact, get that, fact, will be proved false (laughs) and will be replaced by a new theory. So our knowledge of the universe is in such a state of flux that we should challenge anyone who claims Genesis 1 to be unscientific. Because they don't even believe their own science after a few years because they find out, oh, we were wrong, and oh, we were wrong. 
What an example with this coronavirus, right? Oh, we were wrong. Oh, we were wrong. I, I mean, I'd be, I'd have had more respect if they said, we don't know. We'll find out and let you know in a couple months, right? But uh, they said this and then, uh, wrong, wrong, wrong. And I'm not mad at them. They're just man. But when God speaks, I'd rather take his word on it, wouldn't you? Yeah, no doubt about it. Think if the Jewish people would have played, paid close attention to what Moses wrote. They would have never worshipped the false idols of the uh, pagan neighbors there in, in near, nearby Israel. And here we have God's own statement, His witness concerning origins. And all we can respond with is humility and reverence. What a God. As you, we explore this chapter, that's, that's all, all we can say. Wow, what a God. We're going to look at the first three uh, days of creation here, and we see God makes three spheres of activity. For me, this helped me. Some of you may have struggled to learn the six days of creation. Well, there's really only three things to remember, and they all connect. Let me help you with that. There's three spheres of creation. There's the heavens, there's the land masses, and then there's the waters. The heavens, the land masses, and the waters. And uh, those, the three creation days, he fills them with these appropriate forms of life in the last three creation days. So he didn't put the birds in the ocean or the fish on the air, right? He puts them in the right place. But just think about it for a minute. In day one, he created what? Light. Day four, he creates what? Sun, moon, and stars. So he creates the lights, right? Uh, that uh, he was going to have in, in our, our skies. All right? Then day two, he creates what? The sky. Yeah, and the water. Day five, he fills that. The firmament is the sky between the waters. And so he fills that with birds and fish. Day three, he causes the continents to rise, right? And you have land. So he creates earth. And day six, he fills the earth, right? With animals and all of that. And uh, then eventually the crowning creation, man. That helped me. That may help you in remembering the days of creation. And uh, like sometimes we get confused what is where. And uh, if you, when in doubt, just go back to Genesis 1. You can read it, all right? Number one tonight, I want you to see, we see, first of all, God dealt with the darkness. I love this. Right in the beginning, God comes to this world, He deals with darkness. Look at verse 2. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. I love that when there was darkness, the Spirit of God moved. Now think of that. In your life, at one point there was darkness. And you were without God and without hope in this world, and you could not see. You were blinded by the God of this world, and the Spirit of God moved. Think of that. Brought you light, right? The Bible says that, that if the gospel goes forth, the light of the glorious gospel will shine in. And, and that's what happened to us. It reminds me of salvation. You know the Lord is your Savior tonight. Has the light of the glorious gospel shined into you? Do you know the Lord Jesus? Have your eyes been opened to the light of God? If you died today, do you know where you'd be? Are you saved? If not, God wants you to trust Him tonight. Get saved in the book of Genesis just as anywhere else. You see the Lord's hand all the way through. Verse 3, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. Now, I love that the first time recorded that God spoke, He's saying, I want to send light. I want to give light. God said, Let there be light. It's interesting here in verse 3. He uses the phrase, and God said. You'll find that ten times in chapter 1. And God said. Some people have called that the first set of commandments. The first set of ten commandments. And they've never been broken. Um, the second set, of course, all have been broken, except for by the Lord Jesus. But the statement that dispelled the darkness is, is striking here. He just says, light be. And light was. Just like that. Some would say, well, what, where would the light come from? You don't have the sun, moon, and stars for three more days. Well, I believe light just came from the Lord, who is light, right? The light of the world is Jesus, and so He was the light. In heaven, there will be no more sun, moon, and stars either, and He would be the light, right? But uh, it certainly came from God, because God created it, and it was His light. But it's interesting about light. You know, no one, even today, nobody can tell you what light is. They can tell you what it does, but they don't know what it is. Now, that's amazing. 
one of the most mysterious entities in the universe is light. In physics, it's become the new absolute. Uh, no, it, it doesn't matter what is happening. It doesn't matter if there's two spaceships in outer space moving at a thousand miles an hour towards one another. The light from those spaceships at that point is moving at 186,000, I think it is, miles per hour. Doesn't matter how fast that spaceship is moving, the light speed does not change. That's interesting, isn't it? Light speed is always the same. It's a constant. It's, it's the heart of the famous E equals MC squared, right? By Einstein, energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. That ushered in the atomic age. And God said, that was it, light be, and light was. Yet we still can't explain what light is. And one thing, one thing that's neat too, and in other words, God's word is not only legislative, it's executive. He doesn't just make the laws, he executes it. He said, let there be light, and some, you know, the angels didn't make the light over here, it just, boom, it happened. She was just singing about it, right? On the ocean, on the, on the sea there, the sea of Galilee, the men are rowing, and, and, and they're toiling and rowing, and, and God says, peace be still. He makes a command, he legislates, but then it also executes, and it was still. Great calm comes. That's amazing. That's our God. Think of Lazarus, that tomb there the Lord came to. He's dead four days. He was already decomposing. Already stinks, his sisters are saying. They've been saying that a long time. I'm probably here. <laughs> I had three sisters. I have still. They're still living. They may be listening. I don't know. <laughs> but they, Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. And no one had to go pick him up. No angel shot from the sky. He's executive and legislative both. And that's amazing. John 11, the leper came to him riddled with that foul and fatal disease. Talk about stinking, rotting flesh. And he said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. He said, I will. Be thou clean. And it was the same almighty word that darkness heard and took their flight in the early dawn of time. And I just want to encourage you that the God that said this in Genesis 1, Jesus was the same, it is the same God. It was the same voice, the same power that said, let there be light that was legislative and executive. It was the same power that could say, peace be still. And it's evident from his words that this is, that Jesus is God. All creation obeys God. Since the dawn of time, I couldn't help but think, do I obey God? All of his creation is still doing, the lights are still shining every day, the, the t ocean is still under its bounds, as God said, all of that. But do I, do you, do we obey God? Have you ever think about where this light came from? I said maybe the Lord, and I think that is probably right. Have you ever think about that? It, it is interesting that in Scripture, light is associated with things. And that's the first thing God makes. For instance, in, in Scripture, light is associated with Christ. John 1, 4, in Him was light, life, and the life was the light of men. John 8, 12, then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Light's associated with the Word of God. The Word of God. Psalm 119 and 105, you know it. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. And light's associated with God's people. Ephesians 5, 8, it, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. The light's associated with God's blessings, Proverbs 4, 18. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. And darkness is associated with Satan. Ephesians 6, 12, the Bible talks about, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Uh, darkness is associated with sin. John 3, 19, this is the condemnation that light has come to the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be repro repro reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. Uh, darkness is associated with death. Job, you can find that chapter 3. 
4 through 6 in verse 9. Light, darkness is associated with spiritual ignorance. John 1, 5, the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. Darkness is associated with divine judgment. Matthew 8, 12. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That explains that right here from the very beginning, <laughs> think of this, right here in verse 4, the first four verses of the Bible, the Bible says, And God divided the light from the darkness. No, no surprise why God separated light from darkness. They have nothing in common, light and darkness. God's people are to walk in the light, John 1 says. 1 John 1. The God's people are to be known as light. The Bible says there in uh, 2 Corinthians, For what communion hath light with darkness? 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 6, let me read it to you. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. And as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." It's interesting, from the very first day of creation, God instituted the principle of separation. Light from darkness. I said to a family this week, I was looking at our school, and uh, they go to another Baptist church, and, and they were talking to us, and I said, yeah, you know, that's something that many people have not looked at, the influence. Morris Cawthon taught, and we as uh, independent Baptists, we as Baptists in general have believed, uh, as Bible-believing Christians have believed in individual soul liberty. Uh, though uh, Islam may put a sword to someone and say, convert or die, we know that's impossible. You cannot change the heart of man by force. Every person has been given a God-given right to choose. And they have a choice to make in their heart to believe. And so because of that, we believe the greatest tool we possess outside of the Word of God and the Spirit of God is our influence. And that's why it's so important that we live the Christian life and purity and holiness, as the Bible says, because of influence. And I said to them, I said, you ever notice in Exodus when God called his people out and Israel left Egypt that they didn't send their kids back into Egypt to be educated. Now think of that. They didn't send them back to the world to be trained. And I, I know I've got a brother-in-law that's a public school teacher. He's a youth director. He's a Christian a good man. In fact, he's youth director and, and Joy's uncle's church there in Knoxville. Yet, he's frustrated with some of the things in the public school, no doubt about that. But many, many teachers in the public school are not a believer. And to think to give my most precious possession, my child, to an unbeliever to have seven hours, eight hours a day of influence on them, that's more time than you have many times. It's a powerful thought. What communion hath light with darkness? And yet think how Christians, you and me, we try to mix light and darkness every day of our life. It's ridiculous. But here we are light. God calls us salt and light. We're light. And yet we try to sprinkle a little darkness on our life. Well, I enjoy a few things in the darkness. I like some of this. And God's saying, what? What, 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 what relationship? I need to read it again. Let me just read it again. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 to 16. Be ye not unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what fellowship of the righteous and with unrighteous? What communion hath light with darkness? What concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believe with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people." Certainly we go into the world to witness and all of that, but we try to bring the world into our lives so much. We let the world uh, taint our, our light. God said they love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. It's ridiculous that we do that as Christians. May God work in our life right from the very beginning. God separated light from darkness. Number two, God dealt with darkness, but also God dealt with the disorder. The disorder. God is a God of order does things decently in order. Notice verse 6. The Bible says, 
well, let's back up to verse 5. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. The evening and the morning were the first day. Verse 6, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning were the second day. And so God deals with disorder here. And God began by raising the clouds. Now that's pretty amazing. He, he does a vertical parting of the waters, vertically. And uh, this firmament, it literally means an airspace or an expanse, and uh, he's separating the water. We know the upper waters played a role in the flood. The Mears have their 58th wedding anniversary this month, and they're going to see the ark, and so they'll be learning about all the flood things there in Kentucky. And, and, and it, we know, I don't know how much water was up there in that canopy of water that was there. We know the, the uh, barometric and, and the conditions of the world were different then. So things grew and lived. They lived 900 some years. It was different back then. We don't understand all of that. But just get them for, for explanation's sake, in terms of sheer mechanical energy, the work of the second day, not knowing how much water was up there then, let me just talk about how much water right now is above us. The amount of vapor that is continually suspended in the air above us where the, where the birds fly in the sky, is estimated at 54 trillion, 460 billion tons. Tons. You think of the sheer force that it took for God to separate the water. No, that's nothing for God. He sustained it now all these thousands of years. But just the power and the might, the force that it would take. God's dealing with this disorder at this time. Water is 773 times the weight of air. So how in the world is all that water up in the air? But it is. That's amazing. Only our God could do what he does. And to think, the annual precipitation on this earth is 186,000 cubic miles. That's enough to cover the whole globe with three feet of water. And yet we take it for granted. You know, water, Duke falls and rain falls and all the different things. And God is doing all that all the time. That's amazing. The sustaining work of our God. Not just his creating work, but his sustaining work. Uh, we read about that already in Psalm 33. In Honolulu, Hawaii, for instance, I was reading something that the five inches of rain can fall just a few minutes there, the way the rain comes there. But 200 inches of rain fall in a year there. <laughs> if 200 inches can, can fall in a year in one place, think how much rain, how much water is in the sky. God, God does that. That's what God did. He divided the waters. I mean, just in a few words there, he divided the waters above from below. Now, verse 8, where it says heaven, let me explain that. God called the firmament heaven. The Bible teaches about three heavens. Three heavens. And so if you're not really good, you go that first. No, I'm just kidding. All right. That's not true. All right. Three heavens the Bible talks about. First, the heaven, where he's talking about here, where the birds fly. It's heaven, the sky, where the clouds are in there. Okay. Then the second heaven is where... The stars are in the outer space. Uh, play, we have no idea how huge it is. No, man will never know. You know, it's so big. It, it's just like our God. It's infinite. You know, He is able to create something. Just a word that's just our minds will never. In all these years, we'll never get it. No matter how big the computer is built, we'll never figure it out. But then the third heaven is where God lives. It's the heaven and earth that we're. It's the heaven that we're looking for. That that. That place not made with hands, that the Bible says the half's not been told, and I have not heard, and, and I have not seen or ear heard what God has prepared for us. We have no idea what it's like, but we know it's wherever, I don't know where heaven is, but it's where God is. Heaven. And Jesus said he's preparing a place there. So three heavens, that, just to help you with that, that the Bible talks about. Here he's talking about where the sky, birds fly in the sky. Next, we see God raises the continents. Look at verse 9 and 10. And God said, let the waters under the heaven, so we have the waters above the heaven, vertically already, the waters under the heaven now be gathered together into one place, unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. It's interesting, we were, when we did that bungee jump here in South Africa, that was crazy, we were doing it right there on the, in the, where the Indian Ocean is. I'd never touched the Indian Ocean before. But you know what you find out? 
all the waters, they run together. There's only one, you know, all the bodies of water connect, right? And so there is only one. It's interesting, the Bible says here, in one place. And God put it that way. And he says, and let the dry land appear. And it was so, verse 10, and God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. Now, it's hard to find a more simple yet sublime statement of fact in these couple verses. Let me, let me read through uh, verse 13. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. In the English language, uh, from verse 9 to verse 13, you have about 126 words. And of those, over 100 of those are one syllable. You think how great our God is to say something so complex that happened, we still don't even know how it happened. And to say it so simply that you and I can get it. Even in Alabama, even people raised in the South, right? Someone said to me earlier, good. Think of our God. Only supernatural wisdom could compress such a mighty deed, and such simple language. And we stand in awe. We stand in awe of our God. So God dealt with the disorder. And thirdly, lastly, we see God dealt with the deadness of our planet. Verse 11. We just read it. I won't reread it, but I'll just point out the different things. Grass, herb-yielding seed, and fruit tree. Now again, there is so many, uh, right now on, on our planet, they estimate, because they can't really say all of it, they estimate 100,000 species of plant life on the, on the dry land, okay? I don't even go in the ocean right now, just on the dry land. On the globe, 100,000, and yet God just so simply puts in three quick categories, and it covers everything. Grass, you know, there's over 5,000 types of grass, 5,000 different forms of grass. But grass, now grass, he would say it differently than, the, he doesn't mention the seed of grass, because grass seed is so small that you wouldn't see it with the naked eye. That's interesting. Then he says the herb yielding seed after his kind. And we understand what herb, herb types of plants would be. And then he says the fruit type of trees. And we understand that. And, and he says its seed is in itself. <laughs> it's inside. And there's different fruit that we have in our, or in our, even in our yard that drops off. I don't want to eat it. I don't know if anyone eats it. The squirrels eat it. But inside, sure enough, there's a seed in there. And all of it's inside, there's seed. And peaches have that inside and all different apples and so on and so forth. We all get that. And God makes it so simple that we can get it. Life appeared. And it's interesting, when life appeared, it wasn't some struggling, lonely little plant that eventually is going to evolve into all these other plants. No, instantly, all these type of plants were there. It was beautiful. God was preparing for his crowning creation, the perfect habitat for man. Isn't that amazing? That's what God was doing. He was at work for what he was intending to do in creating man. But each, he would say here multiple times, I didn't count them up, but you see in verses 11, 13, after his kind. Notice that. And God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit. Number one time, after his kind. Who sees in itself upon the earth and it was so. Verse 12, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind. And the tree, that's number two, a tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself after his kind. There's number three, and God saw that it was good. Now he's going to continue with that phrase, after his kind, after their kind, after all the way through creation. Each produce after his kind. That's the basic command for all living things. Some of you young ladies, girls here tonight, children, uh, you don't ever have to worry going to the hospital to have a baby one day when you get older and you have a llama. It's not going to happen. You don't have to worry about it. Isn't that great? I mean, our kitten, had, our, kitten our cat was a kitten, had, had kittens. And we didn't have to fear, oh my goodness, are there going to be dogs that come out? We knew they were going to be cats because they all come after his cat. Now it was interesting, she's a gray cat, she had a tiger looking cat, she had a black cat, she had a gray cat. But there's variations of some of them had the pink paws and some of them had the black looking paws and uh, interesting. But all after its same kind. 
God said that. This is the rock on which the whole theory of evolution perishes after his kind. See, God has decreed there be no change from one kind to another. No change. There may be mutation and change within any given kind, but no kind is changed into another kind. So let me ask you, how many races are there on the earth of people? Just one. Isn't that interesting? We all came from Adam, then we restarted. We all came from Noah after the flood, right? And history, boys. There's only one race. It's so like we keep talking about races, racism. Well, that's something that's man made because God only made one race. There's only one race. That's the human race. That's a blessing. But the principle of genetics have firmly established the fact that inherited life characteristics are implanted in the genes. That's not blue genes, boys and girls, all right? You study genes in, in class, right? The genetic code and all that, right? No kind ever changed to another kind. Uh, for instance, a person can go to Florida. Now, I wouldn't unless I burnt and burnt and burnt. But a person that tan, some of you lucky people, who go to Florida for a summer, and they come back with bleached hair and dark skin. And all of a sudden they find out they're having a baby. Guess what? The baby's not coming out with tan skin and bleached hair. It's not going to happen. There's a change there on that person to do the conditions, but that's not in it for them, right? It, they don't, we don't change like that. That's not the way it changes. There's a wide range of variations are possible so long as they lie in the genes, but no visible variation can occur outside the combination of existing genes within a given kind. For instance, I don't play the piano. I'm not going to call one of you all up here, but unbelievable. I mean, we've heard composers and stuff, uh, uh, maybe somewhere you went to a, a concert or something, but even in our, in our church, we have some people very very advanced in the, in the piano, uh, some gifted people, and they can make that thing, you know, speak, right? Uh, many of us couldn't do it, and we stand in awe. Wow, beautiful. And they play all over the notes. There's an endless combination of notes and harmony that can be made, but you know what it can't do? No musician can get to that piano and play anything, any note, any harmony that's not on that instrument. You can't do it. See, that's the way God made it. There's an endless combination, but you can't get outside this instrument. And, and in, our, in our genes, in any animal, no matter a rabbit, a bird, it doesn't matter. There's nothing that can be, go outside of that kind. God said it from the beginning. It will never vary after his kind. The number of variations produced in a given kind is restricted by the number of genes that kind contains. We, of course, in recent years, we've tinkered with genes, haven't we? Genetic structure of various organisms man, man has. And the hope of producing artificial evolution, right? They've got to somehow prove this crackpot theory. Nearly all the mutations that they produce have proved to be harmful, lethal to the, to the subject, or useless to the original, or at the very least, it's sterile. It cannot reproduce whatever is made. It's interesting, just in simple farmer, people get, you have a, have a horse breed with a donkey, and you get a what? Get a mule. What do mules have? They're sterile. Can't have. Interesting. They're just, they only go so far, and that's it, within the genetic code. That's the way God made it. I don't know why I understand it all. I just tell you that's what God said, and that's how it happened. After spending billions of dollars in research, enlisting Thousands of scientists investing countless hours in laborious testing over years. The verdict remains the same. Genesis 1. After its kind. <laughs> That's it. After its kind. God's word stands, friend. You're not going to beat what the Bible says. You're not, it's never going to be wrong. Never. You can count on it. I love that God set the bound of the ocean. There was a, a wise king about a thousand years ago, his name was Canute, King Canute. He ruled England, Denmark, and Norway. He was so wise, he was such a, an able king that his subjects loved him, and they wanted to worship him. And so this king almost couldn't talk him out of it. So Canute refused the adoration of his subjects, and finally to teach them a lesson of his own mortality, he said, carry my throne out to the ocean. They did, they carried it out. He said, put my throne here on the seashore, and he put it below the level of the high tide mark. 
before long, just like it has since the days of creation, the tide started coming in twice a day, right? Here comes the tide coming in and begins to lap around his feet at his throne. The king arose, he waved the scepter over the sea, and he said, Stand back! Stand back, ye ocean tides! Now he knew it wasn't going to work. He was showing his people. But the proud waves rolled on. The account says, it was like that seemed to say, we know you not, O little man. Our limits are decreed by a greater king than you. And so every day, twice a day, since the dawn of creation, the tides of the earth have declared the sovereignty of God and his creation. Isn't that neat? I'm telling you, may God help us to live, not, not going after the darkness, but after the light. May God help us to trust his word. It's true down to the most minute detail. Let's bow in prayer.